Well, good morning and welcome as we gather for our online worship here on the first Sunday of August, August the 7th, 2022. Hope that the first week of August has been a good one for you. I kind of made the mistake this week uh, with my teenage daughter saying, do you need any back to school supplies? And this was on August 1st. You know, so she was kind of looking at me and going, it's way too soon for that, Dad. But, you know, well, we as parents get kind of hopeful at this time of year that school's coming closer, getting back into the school. But uh, we know that we still got another three, four weeks and want to take the full advantage of it, don't we? Something that we are going to be having very shortly at our church is our annual garage sale. And that's going to take place on Saturday, August the 27th. So, two things. If you have any items that you would like to donate, if you could make arrangements very soon to bring them so that we can make sure that they can be priced and properly sorted to be part of our garage sale, we'd greatly appreciate it. But also greatly appreciate it if you'd come out and join us and, you know, just come and buy something or just come and say hello to us. That would be a wonderful blessing too, to be able to see each and every one of you on the day of our garage sale. So again, that is Saturday, August the 27th. Something else we've been beginning again at our church is our annual food bank Sunday, or sorry, annual, our monthly food bank Sunday. And we're now moving that to the first Sunday of every month. So keep that in mind. And I'll put reminders out there for you that if you would like to make a donation, like to drop off some food items into our food bank uh, collection uh, bin, then you could do so. And we'd make sure that it gets to the Brantford Food Bank. As we know, with the rising prices, it's challenging on each and every one of us, but even more challenging on our food banks right now. So again, if you would like to donate, like to contribute, it's the first Sunday of each month. So if you still want to get something in and you watch this on Sunday morning, maybe give me a message on Sunday afternoon and we can make arrangements to get it before we take it early next week. So with this in mind, we want to worship, don't we? So let's start off with our opening prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give our thanks because we are yours and we are experiencing something very special right now and that is worship. We are smiling and you are smiling because nothing brings you greater pleasure than to see your children worshiping you. So God, in this time of worship, may you see our hearts filled with love and may we hear your words so that our hearts are filled with your strength, with your hope, with your encouragement so that we can keep persevering, we can keep hoping, we can keep believing, we can keep living our faith in this world. We offer our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. So let us continue our worship now with Welcome to This House, followed by Holy, 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 and our opening hymn for today.
Heavenly Father, it is so good that we are in holy worship because we're reminded everything about you, that you are holy, that you are supreme, that you are our creator, that you are all-knowing and all-loving and all-powerful and all-wise, that you, God, have plans for our lives, perfect plans, plans that you've created, plans that you've designed, that you want us to experience. And yes, we live in a fallen world. Not everything's perfect, and we're not perfect because of our sinful natures. And we realize, God, that in our sinful natures, there's times that we go astray, times that maybe our anger gets the better of us, times that maybe we say things or do things that make you shake your head and say, that's not what a child of mine should be saying or doing. There's times, God, that maybe we allow our old sinful natures and our old sinful past to step in. And once again, you say, I thought you were far past that, my child. So God, for any of the ways that we've maybe sinned and erred during this past week, once again, we come to this time of prayer and confession and lay them before you. Because we realize, God, that we are in need of repentance, and we are in need of grace and forgiveness. So God, we ask that you bestow your grace upon us. Bless us with the forgiveness that only you can provide, so we may be uplifted, our hearts may be lifted of that guilt, and we can be at peace again. So God, thank you for hearing our confessions. Thank you for allowing us to repent. Thank you for lifting us back up, and help us, God to be better in the ways that we live, to be more Christ-like, to be more loving, to be more caring, to be more appreciative and more thankful each and every day. We offer this prayer in Christ's name, who taught each and every one of us when to pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Well, for our special music today, we have Jane Pritchard and her sister Linda who came to join us for a visit from California to provide us with our special music today. Let us enjoy. <laughs>
continue on with our memory verses and today we're going to look at Psalm 135 verse 5 and this is a very powerful verse and as soon as I read it, it just jumped out at me, it leapt out at me because I loved what the psalmist said. He said, I know the greatness of the Lord. And I think two key words here. One is, no. He just doesn't say, I've heard of the greatness of the Lord. No. I know. So, let's think about it. How do we get to know something? Well, we have to either read about it, or we have to experience it, don't we? So, it takes some effort on our part to get to truly know something. But, as we see, this is a deeper knowledge, isn't it? Not just a slight knowledge that God is great. No, you can sense in the psalmist's words that he has gone through maybe some tough challenges, some tough situations in his life. And because of those experiences, because of what he has seen about God, he's able to come right out and say, I know. And that is confidence, isn't it? That is assurance. And that is faith. And shouldn't that be our type of understanding when it comes to the things we know about God? And we see here, what does he know about God? I know the greatness of the Lord. And isn't this so important and so vital if we are going to get through challenging times in our lives? To be able to have a memory verse like this, I know the situation seems dire, but I also know the greatness of the Lord. See the difference? See the hope? See the different perspective that that gives looking into that situation? Or I know the doctors have said that this is hopeless, but I know the greatness of the Lord. Do you see the difference in our sense of peace, our sense of confidence and assurance as we face a situation like that? Or if somebody says, I know that this is going to need a miracle. There's no other way to get through this. But you can say, and I know the greatness of the Lord. Realizing that no problem is too hard for God. No problem is too big. No problem is too difficult. As we see, if we can make this a memory verse, I know the greatness of the Lord. Do you see how helpful, how strengthening, how encouraging? And how much this can sustain us as we go through our trials and challenges and situations in life. So let's make Psalm 135.5 another one of our memory verses. I know the greatness of the Lord. A blessing. A message that can truly help us. Well, let us continue now with our story time. And... One thing we're going to be looking at today is things that are in the image or likeness of God. And, you know, you may be an out and about at times and a person that says to you, you know, you look like somebody I've met before. Or you look very familiar. Or do you ever know that you look like this person or that person? You know, there's been times people have said that there's a certain waiter in Montreal that looks exactly like me. So, again, there is resemblances that we might have to certain people in life. Now, I'll be honest with you. Nobody has ever said, you know, you look a lot like Tom Cruise. No, I can't say that anybody has ever said I have some similarities or looks. The only similarity I probably have is we're pretty close in age. But after that, there's no resemblance or likeness, is there? Well, sometimes... People will say, you know, if you have pets, sometimes you can start looking like your pet. Well, here is a young picture of my dog Daisy. Now, do you see a resemblance? Do you see a likeness? I did shave this morning, so maybe you don't notice it with me having shaved. But I kind of hope 
that there's not a resemblance, that I'm starting to look like one of my pets here. Now, as we know, sometimes we can be told that if you're married, that after many years of marriage, your husband and wife start looking like one another. Well, I hope for Nadine's sake, she doesn't start looking like me because she is far prettier and better looking than I am. But, as you know, we also share a very blessed daughter together. And, you know, sometimes one of your children can look like either the mother or the father. There's resemblances, maybe stronger on one side or the other. Now, here is my daughter's grade 10 picture, and she soon is going to be going into grade 11. Now, look at the comparison. Are there similarities? No, if you ask me, I, I think so. But, you know, there's other people who say, no, oh, she looks more like Nadine. And, you know, one feature, I'm glad she has more like Nadine than me, is my nose. As you can see, she didn't inherit the Adlam nose. Now, there are many people that we can resemble and look alike whether it's our siblings, whether it's our mother or our father, or maybe there's a famous person that we might have similarities in features and looks like. But something that Scripture reminds us is that when people see us, something they should be seeing in us is Jesus. And one of my favorite pictures of Jesus is this one called the Smiling Jesus. And when I was at a church in Corona, just outside of Sardia and Petrolia, one of the people there gave me this picture that I still have up in my home office. And the reason I love this one is because you just see Jesus smiling. Doesn't it capture your attention, capture your focus, just uplifts you when you see Jesus smiling. Now, here's the question. When people look at us, do they see a likeness to Jesus? And it's not just the smile, no. It's our qualities, our attributes. When they look at us, do they see the same care that Jesus shows? When they look at us, do they see the same love that Jesus had for others? When they look at us, do they see the same forgiveness that Jesus would show to others? When they look at how we're living, do they see that we too are trying to do God's will and obey God's teachings? One of the things that we should begin to ponder is this, is how much are we becoming like Jesus? As people begin to look at our lives, begin to look at our spiritual growth, do they see us becoming more like Jesus or less like Jesus? Do they see us growing in our faith? Or maybe becoming stagnant in our faith and not doing the things in which Jesus did. So one of the things I want you to ponder about as you think about today's service and as we move into the sermon, we are created in God's image. And because of that, one of the things God desires is for us to become more like Him. For us to become more Christ-like in our ways. And one thing I think it's important for us to ponder from time to time, are we beginning to resemble Christ in the way that we live? Not just with only a smile, but also in how we live our faith. That is our story and pondering time for today. Well, let us continue now with singing our next hymn.
Noah days and Noah ways. Let us come before God, shall we, in our prayer for understanding. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is so good for us to be able to spend this time with you. You've already enlightened us. You've already encouraged us. You've already given us so much to ponder about with a memory verse, our story time, with the songs that we've been singing and hearing. But we know, God, you have so much more in store for us. And that is Holy Scripture. Hearing your word preached. And we ask, God, that as we listen to your word and message today, that you give us hearts that embrace, hearts that can be filled with hope, hearts that realize there might be things we need to change about our walk, hearts that desire to become more Christ-like. So God, we dedicate this time to you. Speak to us, and may we be your recipients. We offer this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Well, you remember last week in our series of Noah Days and Noah Ways, we looked at the first thing that Noah did after he was given permission to leave the ark, and that was to build that altar out of stone and earth. And we understood why it was so important. Because what did altar moments do? Well, the first thing, it allowed and prompted people like Noah and others to spend time communing with God, whether it was in prayer or worship. That the second thing, that those altars would do, it would mark memorable encounters that they had with God. Something that they would always remember. Something they would never forget. And then we learned the third reason why these altars played such an important part. It was their way to remember God's promises. Promises that He made and promises that He kept. And then we discovered the final reason why they built these altars, it reminded them to keep God at the center and focus of their lives. So as we saw, an important way for Noah to live in his days before the flood and after the flood was to have these altar moments. And we learned, so important for us too in our ways and our days. Now, what is interesting, after Noah spent that time worshiping God at the altar, something that God did for Noah and his sons was to bless them. Because in Genesis 9, verse 1, this is what we read, Then God blessed Noah and his sons and told them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Now, when I read that, I began to realize, didn't we hear this before? Didn't we see God do the same thing for Adam and Eve after he created the first humans? Remember, we got two creation accounts, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. So in Genesis 1, after God created humans, we discovered that God did the exact same thing. This is what we read. Then God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and multiply. So isn't it interesting? That is... God had Noah and his children set forth on his new creation after the flood, that he did the same thing he did for his creation when they started to live life on earth. First of all, he blessed them. But we saw another similarity between the two too, didn't we? The command to be fruitful and multiply. Now, I kind of wonder, with Noah being over 600 years old at the time, did he turn to his sons after that and say, I think he's talking to you guys, not to me, about that particular issue. But we see, those are the first two things, wasn't it? The blessing, and then the command to be fruitful and multiply. But as I began to dig deeper into this, I realized there was another similarity between what God did for Noah and his children once they got off the ark and started their new life and what he did with Adam and Eve. And the third similarity I saw was this, that in both situations, he gave them reign and authority over the animals in his creation. Because this is what we read in Genesis 9 verse 2. All the animals of the earth all the 
birds of the sky, all the small animals that scurry along the ground, and all the fish in the sea will look on you with fear and terror. I have placed them in your power. So once again, just as he did before in the Garden of Eden, giving people, giving Adam and Eve reign and power and authority over the animals and over earth and creation, we see God is doing the same thing here as they started their new life after the flood. But what does this mean? Does this mean that we can take advantage of God's creation? No. What it means is this that we need to treat it in the same manner and fashion that God would, to show respect for his creation, show respect for the animals, show respect for the environment, because we live in cohabitation with the animals, with the environment, with God's earth, don't we? So that's what it really means when he's giving us reign and authority over the animals and his creation, that we need to show the same respect and care for it as God does. So, three similarities we see between what God did for Noah and his children after the flood and what he did for Adam and Eve when he first created them. But, what I found interesting after I noted these similarities is there were two slight differences as well. Here's the first difference that I picked up on. Prior to the flood, people were only vegetarians. Do you know, back in the Garden of Eden, the only thing God allowed Adam and Eve to eat were the fruits from the trees that were in the garden and, of course, whatever they planted with the seeds. And again, even after they had to be banished from the Garden of Eden, they could still plant and grow their crops and eat the fruit of the trees. People were vegetarians up until the time of the flood. But here's a difference. After the flood, in Genesis 9-3, God said to Noah, I have given them, meaning the animals, to you for food, just as I have given you grains and vegetables. So, we see a difference now then now God is allowing people to eat the meat from animals. This is the first time. And one of the things we see in Genesis is kind of an explanation of how things came into being and when they came into being. So we're being told at this point that people were vegetarians up until the time after the flood and then they were finally given permission. Now, some of you may be saying, but I'm sure there were meat eaters before then, Dean. Well, maybe. But if they were, they were doing it going against God's wishes and commands. And as we saw in Genesis 6, there were a lot of people doing things that went against God's wishes and desires back in those days and times. So, maybe some people were, but if they were, they were doing it and going against God's wishes. But now, he was giving permission for people to eat the animals. Now, the second difference is a very, very major one. This time, God is making it very clear that he is going to make people accountable if they kill or harm or maim anybody. And this is something we see in Genesis 9, verses 5 to 6. He says, And I'll require the blood of anyone who takes another person's life. If a wild animal kills a person, it must die. And anyone who murders a fellow human must die. If anyone takes a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. So here's a major difference between what God did back in the time of Adam and Eve and what he did after Noah and his children left the ark. This time, he's giving clear instructions that he'll be holding people accountable for their actions, especially if they murder or harm any other person. Now, that never happened when God placed Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. And you might be saying, why? Why did God not give that command? Well, here's the reason. There was no sin at that moment. Sin had not entered God's creation at that moment, had it? The fall happened afterwards. And as we realized, after the fall, what happened? In Genesis 4, the first murder, 
where Cain killed his brother Abel. And by the time of Genesis 6, we are being told that everything people did was consistently evil and corrupt. So there was a lot of harm, a lot of murder, a lot of such behavior going on. And God realized that after he began this fresh start, that what would people do? Not learn. That many people would begin to turn away from God and begin to do the same terrible things. So now, God is making it very clear to them that he is going to make people accountable if they harm or maim or kill anybody. And God is all-knowing and wise, isn't he? That's why he said to the people, you know, in Genesis 8.1, I will never again curse the ground because of the human race, even though everything they think or imagine is bent toward evil from childbirth. That is in Genesis 8.1, after the flood. So, God is realizing that even though that I've cleansed the earth, and I'm not going to do this again, that people's natures are such that they tend to bend towards doing evil things. That is why God had to make this command very clear. I am going to hold people accountable. But here's what I find so interesting about this passage is God also gives us an insight into why people were doing the terrible things they were back in Genesis 6. We learned before that they turned away from God, but God even went more specific, the failure that these people were having. And we saw it at the end of that verse in Genesis 9, 5 to 6, that people were forgetting that they had been created in God's image and likeness. Do you remember, back in Genesis 1, 27, one of the things that God gave the blessing, but we also see that God made people in his image and likeness. And one of the things people forgot back in the times of Noah before the flood is because they were turning away from God, they no longer saw the image of God in themselves. And obviously, they no longer saw the image of God in others. And that explains why they took advantage of one another, why they did corrupt things, why they did evil things, why they murdered one another. They failed to see the image of God in themselves and others. But Noah? Noah was different. Why was Noah the only righteous person? Why was Noah the only blameless person? I think it's very clear, isn't it? Because he lived his life seeing the image of God in him and seeing the image of God in others. That's why he showed patience to others. That's why he didn't sin towards others. He saw the image of God in them. As we see, a key aspect to Noah's living in his days is unlike the other people in his days and times, he lived his life seeing the image of God in him and seeing the image of God in others. Interesting, isn't it? And as we know, we've heard that before, isn't it? That we are created in the image and likeness of God. But what does that really mean? Well, it doesn't mean that we are the same as God, or can be the same as God. Because remember, God is our creator. God is supreme. He and he alone is God. But here's what it means. That because we have been created in the image of God, that we can show and display some of the same character traits as God. So, what are some of God's character traits that we enjoy, we embrace? Love, patience, kindness, gentleness, forgiveness, faithfulness, and so on and so on. All very wonderful attributes and qualities that we embrace about God. And because we are made in His image and likeness, that we too, with the help of the Holy Spirit, can develop these types of attributes in ourselves. That's what it means to be made and created in the image of God. Now, we have learned that in Noah's days, in Noah's ways, he lived his life in a society that didn't always see the image of God in others. So let me ask you, are we living in a similar time? 
Are we living in a time where some people fail to see the image of God in themselves and fail to see the image of God in others? I think so. Because doesn't it explain why we see the random acts of violence that we do, where people take innocent people's lives? Or doesn't it explain the wars and the atrocities of wars that we see going on? Or doesn't it explain why we see people abuse others, whether it's physical, whether it's emotional, whether it's spiritual? Or doesn't it explain why people will take advantage of others, why people will do things that really show a disrespect to somebody else's person or worth or value? So I do think that one of the problems we are seeing in our days is very similar to Noah's days, that there are many people not seeing the image of God in themselves, nor seeing the image of God in others. And one thing we know about this, God will hold them accountable. Because as God made it very clear in Genesis 9, from that point forward, He was going to make people held accountable for their actions if they did not show the love and respect for others because they are made in the image of God. But here's something we need to also remember. We too will be held accountable. We see it's a problem in our days, but is it a problem that we may have with certain people or certain situations? You know what I mean. There are certain people who rub us the wrong way. There are certain people who maybe did things or just get so much on our nerves that we lose our temper with, we lose our patience with, we're short, we're snippy with. Are there people in your life where you don't always display the image of God in you or see the image of God in them? That is something we need to really ponder, isn't it? Something we need to reflect upon because we might do this in, with certain people in certain situations, but the reality is there are maybe some people in situations that we fail to do this with. And we need to remember, we will be held accountable. Now, some Christians may say, well, God, how do you expect me to have all of your character traits? Maybe it's you who needs to change, not me. It doesn't work that way, does it? We can't expect God to change His nature and His ways to match our ways and our behaviors. And would we really want that? We wouldn't want God to be inconsistent with, say, His faithfulness, maybe like we are, or inconsistent with His kindness, maybe like we might at times, or inconsistent with His forgiveness, as we might be with some people. No, it doesn't work that way, nor should we want it that way. God has put His image. He has put His likeness in us. And one of the things He helps us to do with His Holy Spirit is help to develop these attributes of kindness and love and gentleness. And if we really think about it, if Noah, in days as bad as his prior to the flood, could see the image of God in him and see the image of God in others, even though they were doing such corrupt and evil and vile things, and can't we do the same in our days, in our times? And wouldn't it be nice that just as God looked down upon his creation back in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7 and saw that Noah was living his life righteous and blameless because he saw the image of God in himself and the image of God in others, that when God looks at you and I, he sees the exact same thing. It worked in Noah's days. It was a great way for him to live. And I think we'd all agree. In our days, isn't it the best way we can live? Seeing the image of God in us and seeing the image of God in others. God bless and amen. Well, let us continue now by singing our next hymn.
join now in hearing the second piece of special music by Jane and Linda today. Let us enjoy it. on September the 10th at 2 p.m. But as we know, I think we've all experienced grief and loss. We've all had people in our lives who have passed away over this last bit. And we just want to pray for those who are grieving. We also want to pray for the people going through hardships right now, whether they're financial, whether they're emotional, whether they're of another nature. We just want to pray for people who are in need at this time and pray for us and our families too. So let us pray as a community of faith. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time of worship. You've spoken so much to us through this time. We've been reminded of some very powerful lessons, how great you are. But we've also been reminded that it is so important for us to see the image of God in us because that reminds us of the character traits you want to grow and develop in us. And if we haven't been doing that, God, help us to do so. And maybe if there's one attribute that we're falling short in, to help us focus on that so we can maybe grow in our gentleness or grow in our kindness or our patience or whatever, so that when you do see us and when others see us, they see Jesus smiling. They see that we are doing our best to be Christ-like in the ways that we live. It's a good way to live, as Noah discovered, and it's a good way to live as we believe. We pray this day, God, for the family of Grace Allen. We know that Grace lived a long, good life, and you have called her to come home to be with you. And we just ask, God, that you be with Grace's children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren at this time. Help them as they walk through this very difficult loss. 
We know that Grace is secure with you right now, reunited with her husband, reunited with her sisters and brothers who have gone before her. And we just ask God for your blessing upon the family at this time. Help them through their grief. We know they're looking forward to a celebration of life. Be with them and touch them and help them. We pray for others who are grieving. We know, God, there are many who are going through this right now. In the low moments, give them a special memory. In the sad moments and crying moments, wipe away their tears. In the moments of hardship and aloneness, make your presence known to them. And may they know that their loved one is with you and happy and secure. So thank you, God, that you can help those who are grieving. We pray for the sick. We know many are experiencing COVID right now, others are experiencing cancer, others are maybe awaiting various surgeries, that, procedures that have to happen. And we just pray over them, God, and just ask for your hand of healing to be upon them. Give them the hope they need, the strength they need, the healing they need at this time. We pray as well, God, for those who are struggling to make ends meet. We know this is a big challenge right now with the cost of gas, the cost of food, just things becoming more and more costlier to buy. And we just pray, God, that you will help those who are in desperate need, that you will make their needs provided for. We know that's what you do, and that is what you're faithful at. We pray as well, God, for those going through emotional suffering right now. There's a lot of depression, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of struggling in people's minds. And help them, God, to know that you are there for them. Help them to realize that there is light at the end of the tunnel. There is hope where there is despair. Be with those going through emotional turmoil at this time. We pray over our families, God. We know the situations that we and other family members face, so we just pray for our families that you will be there to address them and help each of our needs. We pray over our churches. We know these aren't easy times for businesses, but churches as well. Churches haven't been getting all the people back. Finances are troubling. But we just pray for your churches, God, that you'll continue to faithfully provide, that you will lead people back as they feel the need, and that you will bring the lost sheep back into the churches that could truly bless them. God, we give our thanks for this time of prayer. There's so much we could be praying for. We continue our prayers for the people of Ukraine. We continue our prayers for those who are suffering. Watch over us and bless us and keep us, God, in Christ's name. Amen. So let us join now in singing our closing piece for today.
online worship here on Sunday, August the 7th. I pray that you've enjoyed today's service, that it has touched and inspired you. I also encourage you, as I always do, to share it with somebody else because online worship is an easy way to make you know, a ministry known to some people who can maybe truly be helped and blessed by it. So I encourage you to do that. I also encourage you that if you feel that you are ready to come back to church, to come when you feel so willing to do. Because there is a difference, isn't there, between online and in-person worship. And I just pray that you will be led back at that perfect timing by God. And also just remember, we're going to continue to offer this. So don't be disappointed. We will continue to offer it and pray that it continues to meet the needs, that people will be able to be blessed by it. So after the benediction, we will sing Go Now in Peace, followed by O Canada as our ongoing tribute to our frontline workers. And now the benediction. May the road rise up to greet thee. May the wind always be at your back. May the sun shine warmly upon thy face, and the rain fall softly upon thy fields. And until we meet again, may God hold each one of us safely in the palm of his hand. God bless. Amen. And we will see you next time.